So ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Jaime Correa and I'm an associate professor in practice at the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and the coordinator of this lecture series. On behalf of the Dean of the School of Architecture and Technoglass, our sponsors, I would like to welcome you to the Spring Technoglass Honor Lecture Series of 2021. But before we start, let me remind you to keep your microphones off at all times. This will facilitate a lecture without interruptions. If you're attending this lecture for the sake of continuing education credits, please acknowledge your presence through an email to Professor Steve Fett, S-F-E-T-T -T, at miami.edu. S-F-E-T-T -T, at miami.edu. At the end of the lecture, we will have a panel discussion led by distinguished professors, Jean-Francois Lejun, Eric Furley, and Edgar Sarli. Now, Christine Blanchet, a French journalist and art historian said, if I had to choose one word to describe Lina Romet, it will be humanist. Lina was born in Beirut. She wanted to become an archeologist, but ended up doing architectural studies at the American University of Beirut. It was there where she first looked at the notions of memory, space and landscape through a personal methodology that with the mind of an archeologist, she called the archeology span of the future. Lina then moved to Europe to continue her graduate education at the Cole Special d'Architecture in Paris, where she was an associate professor between 2008 and 2015. In 2005, while working in London and collaborating with Atelier Jean Nouvel and Foster and Parents, she won the international competition for the design of the National Estonian Museum. This building has been acclaimed by the international press and has become a symbol for a new kind of French avant-garde, a symbol of a new aesthetic and of formal simplicity and material asceticism. This, in my opinion, is what characterizes her best work and what makes her intervention so relevant to the contemporary discourse in architecture, landscape, interiors, and cities. Lina was selected by the European Architects Review as one of the 10 visionary architects for the new decade. She, ha she has won numerous awards, including a prize for, from the French Ministry of Culture in 2008 and the Prix de Jean of the French Academy of Architecture in 2016. This year, she will be exhibiting her work at the Biennale de Arquitectura in Venice. She's actively involved in the academic world and has taught and lectured in schools and institutions across the world, including, as I said before, the Ecole Speciale Special d'Architecture, Columbia University, the Royal College of Art, and Parsons School of Design. As a personal note, uh, I just don't know how she does it, but somehow she manages to hire the nicest people in the world. Although I do, don't do this often, I want to acknowledge the help of her staff, and particularly Tia Flynn, Amanda Capaore, and Sophie at the Press and Communications Office. On behalf of the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and Technoblast, please let us welcome Lina Gromet. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jaime. Thank you, Rodolphe, uh, and thank you, Technoglass, for this uh, invitation for this lecture. I'm very pleased to be among you all. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot see you in person, but I hope there will be occasions to, to meet uh, very soon and to be doing this lecture in person. I thank you for thanking my team. I have Thea here next to me. She can say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Always someone uh, like an angel. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I will I will share my screen and uh, and start uh, like the presentation. Okay. Let's 
screen. Uh, I hope you're seeing now my screen. So, uh, as you say, like uh, when uh, the thought behind the, the work that I've been leaving in my office and practice is uh, the notion of archaeology of the future. It's, it's a kind of uh, research oriented studio where we're working uh, every time, every project is like a quest uh, for, uh, for references, but for also uh, like questioning basically our space, our environment and how we could intervene. Uh, so it's a, it's a multi uh, multimedia research, whether it's uh, through uh, material uh, work, uh, working with models, with uh, imagery, with sketches, with uh, uh, really going back to notions of history and uh, trying to almost go back to the origin of things every time we start a project. And actually today with our uh, digital world, uh, of course we are uh, working with all the latest tools, but we always are very keen also on working uh, with models. It, it allows us to, to sense the space, to understand the site and to uh, make errors as well while we do things and learn from what we discover while the hand is moving through the material and the work. This also is a series of sketches that I do and they superpose themselves like palimpsest every time uh, on every project. And as I was saying, it's always like a questioning every intervention from uh, the origin of its typology. So uh, thinking, how do we move in our urban space, our construct from a tent into a high rise building? And would it be just about uh, putting a building on site or is there something below to dig for and to emerge on the site? I always like to show this photo of uh, this obelisk uh, that was found in Egypt where we find this, uh, this kind of um, archeology span uh, that is uh, unfinished and that allows people to appropriate it and to uh, kind of tell a new story. And I see architecture in a certain way as this kind of emergence uh, of, uh, uh, of a space uh, that, uh, that has this notion of a déjà là because it relates to the memory of the site. Of course, living and growing in Beirut, uh, I, I studied in uh, Beirut, as you said, and uh, I lived uh, the, the years of war in Beirut, and I also lived the city that was completely uh, and constantly under construction. And every time we would want to reconstruct, uh, we would dig down and discover its guts, discover its history, discover the archaeology that narrates uh, civilizations but also see how nature in a certain way comes and brings into all this environment a very poetic feel and does transform every ruin or every violence that the city would live into a kind of a beauty. So this growing with this actually uh, also made me aware of the importance of nature, nature in its organicity and in its uh, you know, uncontrollable uh, uh, in a way grows uh, and how important it is to intertwine with architecture and with the spaces that we live with. It's in a way also an environmental uh, awareness of, uh, of the context. And as we see here, for example, this photo by Fouad Al-Khoury who took an old house where we see the staircase just coming in and uh, getting into a house and that this relationship with the outside and that intertwines with nature. So if we go back to the notion of architecture, uh, in a way, it is situated between archaeology, uh, future, nature, and the human archaeology, because it invites us uh, to dig down into the past, to find stories, uh, to emerge from Earth. Uh, humane, it's about inclusion, it's about uh, equity in space, humanism, craft, the hand. Uh, nature, because it's about nurturing ecology, sustainability, and the future uh, in the way we are uh, finding and uh, like constructing a new uh, existence, actually, in an environment. This way of thinking and uh, this method of work uh, that is always very research driven uh, goes and allows us, allows us actually to cross scales, moving from the scale of scenographies 
like the scenography that we uh, have done uh, a year and a half ago in Tokyo, uh, about 15 master crafts uh, artists in, um, from France that traveled into Tokyo. So really working on scenographies, ephemeral uh, constructions that are a play of light and shadow, talking about here the, the, the Tanizaki if we, or the notion of uh, how light can be perceived in such a culture. The same exhibition moving to uh, Beijing and here having completely different feel with this red that reminds us of the Forbidden City. So every time moving from such a scale into uh, sometimes much larger scales actually and thinking about uh, the city on a scenographic scale. For example, this is a work uh, of uh, an urban design that we're doing uh, for the rehabilitation of the uh, ground of Montparnasse Tower. We're working on that with Roger Sturz and partner. And it's all about really creating a, almost a mise-en-scene of the city and relinking this tower to the rest of the uh, Haussmannian Paris. I would like to uh, like focus uh, rather than on all of the projects, of course, I chose like uh, four or five projects, two of them completed, one is under construction and two uh, have been won at the competition and they're ongoing. And to, to show a little bit more closely how this uh, process of work uh, has an impact or what kind of architecture does it result into. And the first project uh, is the Estonian National Museum. And this is uh, the project for which actually I created my first practice, partnership practice. And I had won this project with two colleagues of mine in uh, Paris. And we founded uh, like DGP, which is the first uh, practice that I had. And it's a competition that was open for all uh, architects to participate into. So it's really rare. And uh, today we see more of invited competitions. And it was a very interesting story because it's in Tartu. So it's uh, the cultural capital of Estonia. We are here south of Finland. And Estonia had been like a country that had lived the uh, Soviet occupation. It, uh, like it had its independence in 91. And it's really struggled to create a cultural identity and the, uh, the wish for them to construct a national museum uh, was very important because it's a kind of affirmation of their belonging to the European Union, but also a way to uh, have a house that, that reflects their identity. And the building is set uh, on this uh, historical site where the first institution of a museum has been constructed. Uh, this is like the, what we see here, this old house that was uh, like rehabilitated into a first uh, museum institution. And also the collection itself, it's, uh, it's an ethnographic, ethnographic collection that tells the story of uh, Estonia. So it's really interesting and important because of the narrative that the Estonians uh, build with this collection. What was mainly interesting also on uh, during the competition is the site itself. We are really close to the city center here. We are almost uh, uh, on the fringes of Tartu and we find ourselves in an unconstructed uh, or undense area. And one element that crosses that site, which is this runway, and uh, it turns out why we research that this is the place where all Estonians were struggling for their independence, uh, because it was uh, like a large military airfield, and they would go and make their manifestation on that airfield and uh, like uh, claim their independence from the Soviet side. And this is where they uh, regained their own uh, territory. And what was also uh, fascinating is this kind of continuity in space that that uh, airfield suggested. While the brief of the competition didn't talk about it, of course, it has all the like uh, negative emotional memory of, uh, of what Estonia had lived. But it constituted uh, for me as an architect like uh, a very interesting field of appropriation where the museum could really literally come into continu continuation of that uh, airfield and become uh, an urban uh, building. So the idea was instead of just 
making a building that would ignore the site is really to come up with a building that is able to disappear with the site that starts as a, like a 14 meters high and just drops into that airfield. We see here like this uh, drawing uh, actually that I made during the competition with this kind of uh, uh, almost uh, charcoal feeling and we have this relationship with the landscape that emerges. And here a Photoshop that we made where we were imagining that this airfield becomes a place where the Estonians will reappropriate and become part of the history and the new story that they will build on that. So the idea is that this ground becomes a public ground that is really appropriated by, uh, by the people, by the citizens. It's, it's also a way to open the national identity. I mean, as growing in, Le in uh, Lebanon, I would, I, I always questioned the notion of identity. How do you bound it? We're like all made of so much diversity. And uh, it is also important that architecture could open up identity rather than enclosing it. So it becomes like a, a place for interventions where uh, art and culture can be continuously produced. And funnily enough, uh, this uh, kind of invasion of that territory happened. And during like the construction, when the start of construction start, like when the building started construction, we could see all the Estonians coming and manifesting for uh, that first moment because it really meant uh, like it had a very great meeting, meeting for them. And the building emerges like an archaeology in continuation of that uh, fear. So if we look at the drawing, we have this uh, building that is 70 meters wide. It really uh, like continues that, uh, that airfield, that platform, and then a series of landscapes come into crossing it. There is a lake at some point, and the building over, uh, like over bridges that lake. And these are photos of Adel Khoury, who's, um, who's a client for a project that uh, we did in Beirut, but who also uh, accompanied me to take these photos that I found very uh, poetic. So we could see like how the lake was starting to emerge and then the building comes and overbridges the lake and the side. And during construction, we could see this kind of a mass of concrete that really stand uh, on the landscape and that this, uh, the, the person, the scale of the person as if it's like a, a Giacometti uh, sculpture that crosses the, the spaces. Looking at the inside of that building, the idea was really to, uh, to look back and to bring into the human scale, into that monumental, uh, let's say, drawing uh, of the museum. Uh, and when we look at all the functions that the museum uh, had to house, uh, whether public activities, exhibitions, and offices, all of these became small boxes that are really uh, within the same scale of uh, what we see in the city. So like a scale of the house. And the, the building itself, uh, like as we move forward, we feel like this kind of disintegration of uh, spaces where it, open, it, it opens up to the lake uh, or it opens up to the outside where courtyards could come into the 70 meters and bring the outside into the inside of that building. And as we look at the plan, we see here, for example, the entrance, uh, all the public spaces uh, of the museum as a conference, uh, the, the shop uh, or uh, the uh, different educational areas. We cross this bridge area here where we overlook uh, the, the lake. Uh, there's a library on one side. And then we move forward to, uh, in, in to discover all the exhibitions that are within these spaces. And we, we can see also that the museum institution is really made out of all these offices and conservation uh, spaces. And this is what makes it like a cultural incubator because these people are here to work on, on constantly on the culture and the production uh, of Estonia. So they would be all set here on this uh, facade. So as we see like, uh, like how the building manifests itself among like 
at the entrance of uh, uh, of the museum, we have this cantilever that reminds almost of uh, this uh, airplane, uh, like uh, or the memory of the site itself. This is like a forty meter cantilever, all the metal structure that was completely tested, like we test uh, airplane wings construction. And the same uh, roof becomes the element that really uh, creates or temp like uh, creates the temporality of the, of the whole uh, experience within that museum. So it's like this metal roof that continues within that space. And all these volumes that contain the functions, they slide between each other creating really open spaces that become appropriable by the Estonians, by the museum staff. We can see here, for example, also all the light that comes in. And there's always this uh, the attempt that uh, to, to bring in the light into the, the spaces and to kind of create a porosity within, uh, within these volumes. So the, this, it's, it's almost like a constant discovery within these spaces unfolding one after the other. And then we move into the exhibition and bringing even light into the exhibition spaces, which, which is of course uh, for museum uh, design is always a struggle like with the conservator and the curators, like how to like bring light into the exhibition and allow somehow this con constant relation with the outside. I really like these photos, uh, black and white photos that during the construction, they were taken by Estonian uh, photographer and they really portray the essence of the building because we could see here without any artificial light, the, the dramatic feeling that, uh, that the architecture of this project uh, aimed to portray. So that, that notion of this roof that continues and just uh, drops us out of the building and allows us to uh, to rediscover this other space that exists, which is this uh, platform and airfield. One of the things also uh, that was a challenge for me during that uh, process is how to uh, like question the program of the museum, uh, because normally all museums have one entrance. So you would come from one entrance and then do your uh, tour and then go out. And here we had two entrances. So the whole curational uh, discourse and the way to tell the story of uh, the collection had to also be viable that way. Which is also interesting because in a way, uh, like there is what, what is history and how can we in a certain uh, manner also allow for architecture to tell the stories differently as well, rather than just as a single, singular or constant uh, narrative. Again, these photos still taken by Tonu Tunnel, and we see here more closely like how the roof uh, almost floats above these volumes. Here we see the uh, uh, ticketing area, and then we have these sudden lights that come within these volumes that are uh, like leading into the uh, uh, like uh, cloakroom. So this like sheds of light and bringing really like a porosity into, uh, into that uh, mass and into that space, but also connecting constantly the building to its environment, to its context, playing like with the light that, uh, that just sheds uh, texture on this white surface, as we see it here. And then we move forward and the building becomes uh, like a bridge area here. And this is where we, uh, are overlooking the lakes on the lower part. And this space is just completely an open space, open for appropriations. It was unprogrammed. And it became today a place where Estonians really do like concerts. And it's really adjacent to this restaurant area that is open again to that lake that is completely snow here in winter time. And then there's this kind of always dialogue between the brutality of, uh, of this architecture, because it also had to tell the story of the context and the history of that place, but also a constant poetics that, uh, that, is, uh, that comes from the materiality, but also the play of light 
and here we move uh, forward with the black box area so next to the exit of this uh, of the museum but also the entrance and then the building becomes like almost absent so this kind of play of monumentality and absence at the same time and the platform becomes a place for uh, different artists to intervene. There have been movies that were done uh, uh, on that platform recently, also a uh, concert by Metallica. And then the building with these photos by Takuji Shimura, uh, who took this building uh, when, when it was lively and where people started using it. And we see like uh, here with this furniture that we completely designed, how it you know it brings also another materiality with the wood that is very much uh, a material that uh, is abundant in uh, in Estonia. The library that is like uh, suspended over the lake area, and then some work that really portrays the uh, like this kind of uh, woodwork uh, that Estonians are very good at. And we see here like this. Uh, conference room that opens to the uh, lake area as well. So this kind of always where the eye and the body is always invited to escape and go out of that uh, building. So these were the exhibition spaces. And then this like a long uh, building that really changes with the uh, different weathers and different uh, lights that uh, Estonia has. Like here in summertime, we can see uh, this uh, the, the light behind. It's like a double skin. We have this uh, rain screen on the outside that's almost like a blanket that covers the whole building. And from within, it's like a triple glazed facade and a concrete shell. So this uh, like rain screen also uh, communicates with the environment and uh, is all uh, telegraphed with this uh, pattern that uh, portrays and is echoing uh, the traditional patterns of Estonia that were really done uh, during occupation time as a way to uh, resist uh, this, uh, these constant occupations that they had. It's, it's a symbol of the uh, blue flower, so cornflower, I think, is, yeah, we say in English. And then in the winter time, the building completely uh, disappears and uh, then light uh, gives us another, like artificial light in that case, another tool or medium to, to play with the architecture. So the second project is Stone Garden. This is uh, a project that uh, we just completed in, uh, in Beirut and uh, actually we, we were delivering, I was delivering the project in August and just along the same time that this uh, like sad uh, event happened. Uh, and it, this is really uh, close to the uh, like explosion site. So this is the silo that exploded in August and we are really on the port area. And if we look at the map of uh, Beirut, so this is the whole city center that was uh, completely rehabilitated by uh, a private public company. A lot of debates around it uh, uh, recently uh, when it was done. And this is the site of the project. So it's really on the fringes of that uh, really uh, delimited area. And we're on the port. So it's, uh, it's also portraying the history of Beirut, which is this kind of city, portrait city, and also the city of players. As we see here, this photo by Joki Sirwani uh, that portrays really the, like the constant construction in Beirut that, uh, that is ravaging or just eating up this, uh, the sea constantly but also this constant life that exists uh, always in Beirut. And also the history of Lebanon that, uh, that is reflected in its built environment uh, or even of Beirut that had lived, uh, that, uh, that stretched from the Roman times into the medieval, into the colonial uh, with the French uh, rule until the, like, the establishment of the Republic of Lebanon. 
And this is something that we really see in the urban construct of the city, uh, the city of layers, where we sometimes read this uh, layering uh, moving from uh, like the Roman city and uh, the underlying grid, uh, then to the Ottoman times, and then again to the uh, French mandate with these uh, like a uh, star uh, kind of urban design. So we can see this uh, still houses that uh, are perpetuating the city, disappearing bit by bit. And then the city center that is a constant construction and reconstruction. And before the uh, explosion time, uh, what, what was interesting in uh, Beirut is also this constant uh, feeling of experimentation that could happen within uh, the, the context where we we could really read uh, constantly these small houses that portray the Ottoman uh, rule of, uh, of Beirut, but we can also see these high towers that are uh, portraying the promoter and developers, uh, uh, like uh, the development, but also nature that comes through all of these. The, the questions that are raised also are questions that are very pertinent uh, to, uh, to the world, actually. And this is a photo that I took from the site, construction site of that tower. And the housing conditions are extremely uh, like um, uh, precaire, like very uh, difficult in, uh, in Lebanon or even the world. So the, when, when we're brought to, to construct a housing and build a housing tower, all these questions come along, even uh, if as an architect, we don't always have the tools to, uh, you know, to, to build a social housing when we are coming, uh, when the client comes to uh, ask you to, to build a medium range housing. But this, this city and the, the, the way the uh, phantoms of the city appear cannot be uh, like uh, indifferent to the architecture that uh, one creates. And the site of the uh, tower itself, we're here next to the port area. So this is uh, the uh, site where Pierre Hercouri, who is a famous modernist architect, had his office. Uh, his uh, son and uh, family inherited that site and wanted to build uh, as well a foundation for, uh, for the image for art, but also a, a, a kind of a tower for housing. So the, the whole story started with the encounter of Fouad al who is a, like a French Lebanese photographer. He was at that time in, uh, in Paris. And he's a photographer who photographed Beirut during the war. He's uh, very much known for uh, this publication that he did in 92 with uh, Gabriel Basilico, uh, René Bourri, uh, Raymond de Pardon, and uh, other photographers. And they went to the city center that we've seen uh, a bit of a while ago uh, in my presentation, completely reconstructed, but they went there before its reconstruction and showed how uh, how the, the city was ravaged, but also all these textures that we see on, uh, on, on the city skin and that reveal a very strong materiality in the urban, uh, uh, in our urban environment. Uh, but also photos that uh, had marked me uh, as we, we grew with these uh, instances uh, where we see uh, human beings becoming completely uh, the continuity of their environment and the, and the way they look. But at the same time, this, uh, this uh, materiality uh, solicited my uh, imagination and uh, my, like the relationship uh, to archaeology in a certain way. And these photos, I was taking them in Beirut uh, at some sites, a construction sites. Uh, every time one starts a building, we would discover this kind of archaeology that emerge and that constantly uh, disappear or even traces of other buildings on, on the buildscape. So how, the question, how, how all these come together into a project and between what the, our subjective uh, uh, living as architects, but also uh, the collective memory of the city itself. Uh, and we're here faced with the site that is really by the port, this kind of huge hole that is 
uh, dug in to build the project. So the first approach was to go and really sculpt the urban regulation. This is really like just taking the urban regulation and building a whole, uh, uh, occupying basically the site and really getting uh, close to the, uh, to the buildings uh, uh, on the site. And then afterwards, when it comes to opening up and creating openings within uh, that, uh, that volume, the questions of opening are come really uh, becomes even political, like how do you open in that, uh, in that skin and in that volume when this opening has a lot of meeting, meanings in the city. And here we see photos of uh, Barakat building that uh, I took with my students and when we visited. And there's always this kind of parallel between the destruction and the earth constantly and also the power of the ruin that completely is overcame, over, that is overcome by nature. So for me, like then, the, the notion of opening had to have a new meaning where uh, opening becomes uh, a place of life, uh, a place that inhabits uh, nature and that brings nature into the, uh, the sky of Beirut, but also uh, almost like a pretext to, uh, to bring different sizes of gardens, moving from the large opening with large gardens into the smallest opening with planters also a way in a way to bring difference in the apartments at each level so instead of having the same apartment that is always uh, repeating itself and dictating a certain social construct within the city then every apartment would be different and has a different view uh, into the city and a different layout we see here the photos during construction time. So it's a whole seismic structure and it's all concrete, uh, a concrete construction. And we see the, during even the uh, times of uh, the construction, nature was part of that uh, building. And then uh, actually that time of uh, building really reveals the essence of the project where these openings became almost like photographs as tools to view the city instead of just uh, windows. So they're really uh, tools that, uh, that question the city uh, for the inhabitants. And then the notion of this emergence of earth and the belonging of that building to the ground was very essential. And uh, the whole uh, project uh, was about uh, really working with these artisans I really wanted this small feeling of uh, belonging to the ground and also to, to incorporate the work of the craft uh, and the craftsman into the, into the building. And then we started testing how, how could this be done actually and uh, to bring into the feeling of the chiseling of earth almost into the envelope. And it started with these tests uh, with the with the clay in the office uh, where I took a fork and just like uh, marking these uh, with the, with the fork and then moving from there into the scale of the building, testing that on site. Why not throw uh, and produce a chisel like a comb on the scale of the building and then combing the whole facade? And it's like a it became like a therapeutic uh, process and the workers and the artisans were really part of that uh, process they could uh, sometimes they were like uh, coming to me in the next day saying i have an idea let's do that and it's really uh, like architects almost dreaming about their uh, their work and their realization so here we see the south facade and this facade is bound to be covered at some point because we uh, in uh, Beirut uh, we, we, with the kind of uh, construction law it allows the, the buildings to be stuck to each other and then at some point this building could, could completely be covered if the neighbor like, uh, wants to build higher. And when we're talking about building higher we can see that here where we see like this kind of uh, towers just like completely um, searching the sky of uh, Beirut. So these were photos of Iwan Ban that uh, he took uh, thankfully just before, like two months before the, um, 
at the blast uh, for Domus. Uh, and the building was almost completed at that point, and we could see like this kind of a sculptural feel that uh, that the building uh, portrays within the city. These openings, this sculpting the mass, like opening within the volumes. And then uh, at some point, the the back street, or let's say the southern street, that is linked to my file area, is higher. So we could uh, like enter into the third the floor of the of the project and here the, the building because of the gabarit has more like sculptural feel to it and really like uh, uh, underlines the site on which it sits. What we what we try always to, to do is really uh, to have an architecture that uh, that uh, that works in three dimensionality that you can never ca capture in one photo. I, I I really think that it, it's impossible. Like when you're building on a, such a complex site, how how could you capture a building in one photo? It, it cannot be like you have different uh, different like uh, specificities for each side of the site. So the building has in, in a certain way to uh, to intersect with that and to play with that. Even if, if at some point when drawing that project, I thought uh, like maybe it will turn out to be a monster because it's like this kind of very funny uh, kind of a shape. But it has it has its own uh, persona and uh, it's really surpassed even uh, like uh, my thoughts uh, when I was imagining how it could be. And it had its own uh, its own materiality, its own emotions. People would just pass by and touch it to discover what kind of material it would be. Uh, like it's almost like an inverted earth, where earth is very scarce and becoming more and more scarce in the use. And then on the ground floor, this uh, uh, art foundation, and the, like the lobby of the uh, apartments is this kind of cocoon uh, like womb like uh, space with this kind of uh, circular light that uh, lights up this uh, small lobby and then at some point we have this feeling of being uh, alone in our apartment because of this volume and this shape these are some of the views of the apartments and uh, how the uh, double height uh, spaces look like. These were just before uh, like they were destroyed. And then at some point, of course, there was this blast and this, that was a sketch that I did before an auction, but it was like this notion of the blast and uh, what, uh, what it portrayed in the city. I think also the, the, the face of the silo that kept on really uh, like protected that side of the, of the city, uh, even if the blast was uh, very powerful. And at that moment, I just run, I was in Beirut, I ran to the site to see how the building survived. And that was the first photo I took. And it was really very, um, I don't know how to describe that very emotional moment because it was uh, very sad but at the same time it felt very strange because that building just stood there with the nature and only these uh, windows were blown and at, as if it was bound to happen as if it was really the, 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 the DNA of that building actually to be living such a, such a situation. And these were moments where we could see just these openings and just like almost like the invitation to go drop into the sea in the midst of the chaos. And some photos after the blast by uh, Lorian uh, Guinituyu, who, who took this, uh, uh, the, this kind of uh, also urban scape. And we see here a building by Bernard Curie and then this uh, like, uh, a sculptural uh, building of stone garden just sitting there and just almost like uh, this uh, the building kept its integrity and uh, the whole uh, facade was uh, completely untouched itself because it's just the structure or even like a bunker in itself and nature was just sitting and uh, holding into the the ground 
And again, uh, like always in Beirut, life almost goes on and the people reappropriate the street and uh, this kind of uh, relationship to the outside goes on. And I'm always fascinated by this photo uh, that he took and you could see almost like the context is as if it's in the 80s, even the car looks like coming flashback from the past. <laughs> and then the building just as a collage just sitting in, the, uh, in that photo. So just to keep on in uh, on uh, Lebanon and uh, another project that is awaiting now to go on uh, since the situation is quite uh, economically difficult. Uh, but just to, to continue traveling in uh, Beirut and we're here in Marmi Hayat. So it's really the area that has been very much uh, destructed after the, uh, the blast. And it's a site that is really on the, uh, like uh, giving to the port and to the sea uh, of uh, Beirut, this uh, soliciting this history of, uh, of the city. It's along the railway station also, the old rails that cross. Mar Mikhail also was a place for a lot of artisans that were in, like installed um, like very long time ago in, uh, in that neighborhood. So the site is this uh, square here that is a small piece of nature that still uh, is in uh, Beirut. And we could see here also, uh, we could see here this um, station, uh, railway train station that crosses in, uh, within the site and within Beirut. Mar Mikhail is an area that really uh, portrays this topography of uh, Beirut with these large staircases, these old houses uh, uh, that uh, Ottoman uh, of the Ottoman times, nature that comes and uh, overcomes the, uh, the, the construction, uh, but also the play of facade that exists in Beirut that is really interesting, where everything is possible with this kind of relationship or this uh, skin between the inside and the outside plays a very important role in the city. So moving from that, we were really fascinated by uh, all these uh, like arches and these shapes that, uh, that are coming from the history of, uh, of the city of Beirut and that are disappearing and this notion of the window that really gives you a different feel to the, to the city. And we started for this project to play with these and to try to see how, how would that give a more eclectic uh, construction or eclectic way of living within this uh, housing tower. And again, here with the site moving from there into the volume that, uh, that is uh, like that could emerge from the urban regulation, uh, starting to hollow it and to bring nature into, uh, into that and open it uh, to, the, to the site. And then all the scribbles and uh, thinking, and then uh, thinking, and on the opposite end of Stone Garden, thinking of that building as a skeleton, as really like a kind of an open structure that can uh, be inhabited by nature, by life, by uh, by apartments, by a market on the ground floor, and that uh, emerges within the skyline of Beirut. So it can open up and have these large openings and uh, allow porosity also from one side to the other of the city. Another again project in Lebanon that also I hope it will go on again at some point is this uh, museum uh, uh, that is an open uh, archive museum in the mountains. And here we move into another topography in Lebanon and we're really at the height of, uh, of the mountains. And uh, this is an area that is very much also uh, characterized by these steppings and uh, that also underline the contrast in Lebanon where you move from the city center, which is completely dense with these high rise towers and suddenly you're in the midst of nature with these high uh, pine trees. And the site itself is uh, very nice and very poetic. It has this kind of stepping uh, of, uh, uh, of like ground. Uh, and it really tells this agricultural story of, um, of the, the, these parts of the mountains. 
and also again uh, this uh, notion of emergence within the site. So here we move from this uh, modeling actually the topography of the site and then carving out, taking out this uh, kind of limit of where we have to build and then starting to understand uh, one by one what constitutes that site in terms of staircase or trees and also what kind of program we have to deal with. And when we, we're looking at the program, which is an open archive, so it's like a kind of a new uh, museum, open archive typology, the client wants, wanted not a, really a museum, not an archive, something in between, a place where the, uh, like the visitors could interact with the collection and where the collection had to be mostly uh, really uh, hidden from light and the only uh, tip of, uh, of the building could uh, show, show on. And so we, we started thinking, how could this be like uh, this open uh, house of curiosities or cabinet of curiosities? And what, what would be today a museum that brings back the history of the typology of the museum uh, into life? And the collection is telling the history of Lebanon through a collection of artists that portrayed uh, Lebanon over the time. So it's moving from uh, multimedia into drawing and photography. And then the whole process was really questioning and we went back into understanding what was the origin of the museum moving into the pyramids where the uh, whole uh, like uh, ownings of uh, of the pharaohs were, were kept and then moving into different typologies and questioning how could that be uh, a house for, uh, for a new collection here. And at the same time, given that it's, uh, it's a collection for uh, Lebanese artists, we thought about the typology of the house. Uh, which is this uh, like open courtyard house, the Liwan house, which is really the, the um, typology of these uh, old Ottoman houses that were really organized around the open hall. And thinking about these photos from uh, Gregory Bouchakjian, who took these uh, derelict houses, we thought to superpose these two typologies together, the private house and at the same time, this open collection museum. So the, the building became, became like this kind of a crossing of different uh, typologies, like a cadaver esquive, what we could say in French. And instead of installing the project on the whole side, it's like really digging it into the mountain and making it disappear. And we see here all the trials that we were doing for the, for the project, and then working with earth as part of our material. And then we moved into really uh, locating where we could intervene without uh, taking any tree from the site. And then the whole building became, and the whole museum, uh, open archive museum became dug under the landscape that is completely reconstituted. And the only thing that appears is this, uh, uh, this volume that is an entrance or a large gate into an open hall that becomes a library, a theater, a museum and becomes a place of interaction where all different collections could uh, be uh, put together. And then this landscape is open for uh, sculptures, for other artworks. And the heart of it is a place of uh, encounter, of uh, discovery of a large cabinet of curiosity that becomes flexible. So these were some of the site uh, plans that uh, one of the site plans we did and we see that uh, like uh, building just crossing and cutting the, the landscape and the whole landscape becomes a place for uh, sculptures and for art. And then as it digs into the, uh, the ground, uh, it unfolds with the collection. And we like to do these kind of collages to, uh, to tell the story of the project. And here in section, you can see how, how this kind of a gate comes in and then it becomes this uh, long space, like a big library for art. And then the, the roof is the place for, uh, for just a promenade uh, during the visit of that building and the uh, whole uh, like stepping is reconstituted. 
And the whole actually project was worked in a very sustainable uh, thinking and to see how it could become like a sleeping animal that really has a, a stable temperature for all the collection underneath the ground. And that could really like be uh, working in open cycle with its uh, environment. This is where we see like this entrance and of course the materiality is something that we're working on at the moment. And then we move into that uh, like building and then the roof is just uh, like bringing into disappearance the project. I have one last project, but I don't know if I can have more time or. Yes, please. Because I, I can go on forever. <laughs> so. I will finalize with this one. So this is a project that is under construction at the moment in uh, Normandie in uh, France, so in Northern France. And it's a competition we won uh, like, uh, like two years now ago, like in 2019. And it's a leather workshop for Hermès. And it's actually a very ambitious project because they want to build their first uh, like manufacturer that will be a passive building, uh, low impact, uh, low carbon impact. And uh, that could really be uh, an exam exemplary in terms of sustainability. Uh, and for me also, it was uh, the, uh, the challenge how to bring uh, poetics into a place of manufacture that is not anymore uh, just uh, like identified as an industrial uh, between brackets place, but it could have uh, like gained the poetics of its context. And it's really telling the story of this uh, handwork and the precision of the artisans that uh, work with the material that become almost one with their material as well, that work really with this, with this um, leather and on the micro scale of the leather and the, the traces of the hand uh, on, the, uh, on, on the works, on the uh, products that they are manufacturing but also uh, the question of the trace of the hand on architecture again, and also how, how this building could be really an echo of the material of the context, because we are now like close to a city that is all brick constructed uh, in, a, in a, like a landscape that is really beautiful, that around, of course, a lot of industrial buildings, but uh, like when you see such a landscape, it would not like, but uh, you know, dialogue with it. So we started thinking like how to uh, construct instead of uh, just a fixed project, like a dispositif or like a tool actually, and uh, where the, uh, the grid becomes the, uh, the element and the regulating element of that uh, project that could, uh, that just comes like and um, uh, work, like uh, completes a site, but it's always also possible to grow it by time. So, and what happened is actually that grid became the, almost the perfect uh, form to house the, the uh, program itself, because then all the atelier would be really sitting uh, in a very uh, adjacent way. It, it created a building that is very compact, so that is all uh, like housing the, uh, uh, the manufacturers and the atelier. The idea was also to use a sustainable material, sustainable because it's locally sourced, it's the brick, and to revive a brick construction, uh, brick uh, uh, artisan uh, that is uh, installed very close to the site. And we identified three uh, briqueteries uh, around the site. And then the whole process that was very interesting actually, and that brought me back into all the projects that I did and into really reanalyzing really their carbon footprint and having this, uh, this in mind uh, is, is a very close work uh, into the uh, like environmental impact of the project, but also the calculation of that environmental impact through the materials, through the bioclimatic way of constructing that project, how compact it could be. And to, to realize that actually through uh, just the bioclimatic way of uh, setting on the site, one could really optimize hugely the need of climatization or energy uh, consumption in the project. 
and then bringing into renewable energies to produce the uh, the needed uh, electricity in the in the building by using geothermal energies or photovoltaics and also by using brick actually uh, there was a very a magical echo to the to the horse riding and the saddlery because this building would be the first saddlery uh, manufacturing place and the the natural span of the uh, brick construction would be the arch so the whole like arches became the uh, main uh, feature of that envelope yeah, because it's all brick construction and then it echoed in a, in a nice way, the gallops of the horse. Also interestingly, with the tools that we have today, we could calculate exactly the number of bricks that we wanted to use and bring back the uh, construction and the drawing of that project into the brick scale, but also into the hand scale. We see here the model of the building, like a quick model, with we see the envelope and all the roof is uh, wood construction. And then the work of the landscape uh, that was done with Eric Dont, uh, a Belgium uh, land art, land, landscape architect, and we're working on really uh, listening to the place and just working with the topography and trying to reveal uh, the actual uh, space. And once we enter into that atelier, we enter into the outside, so almost like an echo to a ruin. And then during the construction, here we see the, the, the ground of the, uh, of the site with this uh, like earth actually that is very, uh, that is clay-like and from which we manufactured these bricks. And then uh, we started drying them and then uh, like baking them with this uh, traditional oven. And then the colors of these that you are currently constructing the project. Thank you very much for your listening. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Jean-Francois will be the first one to uh, ask some questions. So we have Jean-Francois Lejeune, professor at the School of Architecture, Eric Fairley, and Edgar Sarli, who would like to ask you some questions. So let's start with Jean-Francois. Your microphone, Jean-Francois. Okay, sorry. I'm going to start in French. Merci beaucoup. C'était absolument fantastique. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know where to comment at this point. You know, whether it's the projects, the materiality, the absolutely wonderful drawings that you have presented to us. But for me, this has been quite a revelation. As a matter of fact, I. I was in Tartu uh, two years ago and I visited your building. Of course, I didn't know wow. about you really, ne neither about the following of your career. And I, I was there for a conference on the uh, rural landscape and the rural colonization of the landscape. And there was something absolutely beautiful to be dealing on that topic within, uh, within the building. So I was really lucky, I think, to have visited the, the structure even though uh, the weather that I had was certainly not as uh, symbolic of the, the project you presented today. As a matter of fact, I'm here in a, in a classroom of the School of Architecture with about 12, 11, 12 students from uh, our program. Uh, and um, we are actually, we've, we've taken a big risk. We're actually doing our studio design on Beirut uh, this semester, uh, focusing on uh, two aspects, one of, one of it are the, the, the children, the needs of the children in a city like Beirut, and, and the other aspect being uh, trying to understand a, a neighborhood that was very close to the explosion, which is the Carantina, Carantina mm -hmm. neighborhood, yeah. and uh, trying to, to develop some strategies for, for that neighborhood, whether they're infill, landscape, uh, reorgan uh, reorganization of the limits and the edges of the neighborhood, all of that to try to see whether a better relationship can be established between port and, and city and, and landscape. So I, I wanted to ask you simply, if, what, advice, what advice would you uh, give to my students 
in this process, in this context of actually working in, in, in Beirut now, uh, what would you say would be important for them to look at or to think about as they are basically embarking on this, uh, on this uh, venture? Yeah. Thank you very much, Jean-François. I'm really happy that you visited the museum. I would have loved to, to be there at that time. And maybe another time we traveled to Estonia. It's such a beautiful country, actually. And uh, talking about that, the, in, like, uh, the population of Estonia is very close to that of Lebanon. And they managed in a very short time to really uh, outspring uh, into their economy. So I really hope <laughs> Lebanon will do it someday. <laughs> Right. Um, so, so I, I think Beirut uh, is a very uh, like interesting subject for architects, for urbanists, for also uh, thinking about the, our uh, environment uh, in general. And I think the notion of uh, boundary and the negotiation of boundaries between uh, whether the public, the private, whether nature and the construct. Uh, whether generational uh, boundary is a very interesting subject to to, uh, to deal with and to to construct upon. Um, it's it's very specific to Beirut. When you're working in uh, Beirut, you have to open completely uh, your uh, uh, your eyes and uh, also your senses and uh, uh, almost to take out any prejudgment one could have because uh, like it's. It's really a territory of a lot of uh, contradictions and a lot of uh, experimentations and porosities. And these could be also uh, points that uh, could lead to a very interesting uh, ways of constructing and uh, very interesting architectures that uh, sometimes uh, could, um, could, could be eye openers to new things actually uh, and new experiments in our urban space. And uh, so, so in a way, uh, and this is what also we see uh, has been happening in the last uh, decade uh, in Beirut. Like uh, there were lots of uh, star architects building there. There were also a, a lot of uh, great architects building, constructing and experimenting. Uh, like the history is intertwining with these. You could see also how the inhabitants would just uh, uh, oversprawl on the streets. So for a student, these are very precious, uh, it's very precious material actually to, to observe and to analyze. So even before intervening or before constructing anything, listening to the city, looking at the city, understanding it and drawing it, layering it is already a, a very rich uh, a process that, uh, that could uh, bring onto a, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of ideas and uh, ways of intervening. Talking about Quarantina, also there is uh, the um, Beirut uh, Heritage uh, Association that, uh, that has been working on the Quarantina area after the blast and has been uh, like uh, surveying the area, bringing in onto its history. So it will be very interesting. I guess maybe you're in contact with them, but it should be very great for uh, for you, for them, even to, to have this kind of dialogue, because I feel like this uh, the student work is what is the most pertinent uh, work to be done for Beirut at the moment, because it's really just out of any prejudgment and it's just really thoughts on uh, how the city could be and uh, could transform. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Hey, Eric. Yes, so, um, thank you so much. Uh, I think this really has textbook quality, you know, I think for our students and for ourselves talking about, I think the link between uh, conceptual and contextual architecture. I mean, all of your projects are landscapes. So I think, uh, and I think if for you, if it's urban landscape or rural landscape, it doesn't really to make a difference as such in the way you work. I think that's, you know, beautiful to see. One of the things that I was interested in, you know, this contextual quality, you know, you worked for people like Jean Nouvel, you know, somebody that I admire enormously. Um, and I think there is a, a lot of this kind of approach, but what seems to me uh, by definition, you're not the same generation, more timely is maybe 
to be even more open-minded in taking in all kinds of different types of information coming from history, archaeology, um, you know, uh, building technology. So it's maybe there's a little bit less artifice from my reading than in some older generations of architects. And what I, I find interesting, and you know, maybe also for our students who will later on, you know, work in, in, in practices, you know, how what are the moments where you can share this with your team? And when is the time where you know somebody has to take a decision and make this very private uh, choice? Because also for me, you know, uh, I don't practice anymore, but when I worked in uh, offices, sometimes it can be frustrating not to be really part of that process. Mm -hmm. But I see a real opportunity through your in-depth contextual approach to go a bit further than um, others. Yeah, um, it's a very interesting question. Thank you, Eric. Um, I think like uh, the, the sharing, the, the whole uh, methodology and the tools of work are all about sharing, basically, because it's all a research-driven uh, process. So it starts with a question about the project rather than an answer, and then I drive the team to, uh, you know, to come, uh, come up with, uh, with historical uh, references and historical understanding what is a museum, what was it in history, or if we're working in uh, Estonia or working in Beirut or in uh, Brussels, uh, what was the urban construct of Brussels and what we, can we learn from that uh, basically into our project. So it comes into like a lot of information and sometimes it's very frustrating because the team is like, oh, where, where are we going with there? But I think for me, it's so important. It's like the precision of this information and what we get and the linear, like let's say the, the depth of the information and the truthfulness of the information that it doesn't become just a reference or an inspiration and then direct translation of that into an architecture. It's really a, an in-depth narrative that brings on all these complexities uh, to become uh, an architecture and a space uh, afterwards. Definitely as an architect, uh, I have to be the, the, the conceptual and the creative leader of that because the, the, the project has to have a kind of strength in my mind and has to have this like line of strength and this narrative both in its conception and in its uh, physical reality from the beginning until the end uh, of it and the realization. And I'm always keen the, to share this and this kind of why of every space and every feeling and proportion of it with the, the whole team that are really bearers and they really uh, lead the, that uh, with me into, into realization. So it is always a constant, um, somehow, uh, negotiation between what I have in my um, mind or what I get uh, as a sense from all what, I, uh, what we gather as information and this kind of uh, collective uh, uh, like experimentation and development of these uh, uh, directions and uh, spaces and perfection of these uh, as we move in time. So it's, it's, it's really a very interesting, very fascinating process because it's also portraying in a way how a building would sit in its uh, environment. We cannot, uh, like, we cannot uh, negate the fact that a building really also talks about uh, his or her ar architect in a certain way. But we cannot say that an, a building is only about uh, that and could not be about that. The building can, has to be and have to live with its context and completely destroy the architect afterwards as well and be able to, you know, to just uh, be uh, itself uh, and then uh, like uh, talk to its neighbors, chit chat with the city and uh, produce something new uh, for the city uh, where it sits. Otherwise for me, it fails as, uh, as a project. Edgar. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, I would say, leaving all of us with a lot of things to think about, uh, I think. You've done a beautiful uh, presentation, but uh, you posed a number of questions through your work and as you were presenting the work that I, I um, have to admit, I'm, I'm going back to my class now to bring up some questions that you posed. Uh, and I'd like to make a, a 
commentary and two very simple questions. But um, if I if I had to share what I'm taking from this experience, from having to um, uh, in a way prepare a question for your uh, for this presentation of yours, uh, I must say that the work presents itself in a very solid way. But what was very intriguing to me were the words that you use when you uh, describe the work, when you write about it. And I think that uh, sheds, sheds a lot of, uh, let's say, optimism into what we are dealing with in architecture. Um, and I, I wrote some notes, uh, beauty, place, memory, identity. You talk about the marks on the facade by the artisans. So uh, placing humans on the foreground of your thinking process. And I think this is what we try to, to do in our courses. And you're obviously doing it at a scale that has a more uh, impactful, let's say, aura. So um, I have to thank you for that. And I have to ask you two things. If you have to give an advice to the students who are thinking perhaps, I wish I had a practice at an early age in my career, because you had a meteor, uh, quite uh, rapid uh, ascension in your practice, right? If I if I look at your biography, it's really very quickly everything is happening in lining up. Would you say that there's a great deal of chance, uh, methodology, planning, and that they should be thinking about? And the other question is, um, if as your work starts to grow in scale, starts to grow in numbers and you're collaborating with a number of people from different parts of the world, is there an archeology span of your own work as you are uh, starting projects uh, anew? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, just the last question that you asked uh, is about uh, like as it grows, does it become an archeology span of my own work? If the body of work is already generating uh, a query for you to draw from. Yes, yes, yes. De definitely, I think uh, it's, uh, I question that every day, actually more, of, more now, actually at this stage of my work, that uh, how, how, what questions am I asking to the work and how also to keep uh, this, um, there's, there's this kind of a story that is not only uh, specific to one project, but it's like a kind of in depth, in depth of a thought or of a, of a process of, of a way of doing from one project to the other. And whether it is through uh, the way uh, the sustainability of a project or the way it can combine uh, both uh, its uh, a kind of uh, uh, poetic and um, uh, architecture quality and at the same time be very uh, uh, very low impact sustainable project and the more we move on the more I feel like we're drawn to that uh, to these uh, uh, like values that uh, that brings me completely back to the past also because they are really almost archaeology of uh, of how we used to construct uh, in a primitive way so you're really brought into a primitive way of constructing into vernacular architecture and trying to push it uh, like and project it into the future so and 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 our capacity also of combining both architecture and uh, the the technique uh, and not only the technique and uh, like the knowledge of craft and the construction but also uh, the whole guts of a building that uh, like the mechanical system of a building that uh, like today as architects uh, we were like more trained like to design and then suddenly the like the mechanical engineer makes his uh, you know all the uh, the system the veins of a project and and it works uh, well the thing things start to become different now that you have to almost think about these guts while you are uh, designing because they have they have to make this building become uh, alive and uh, sustainably alive so these are thoughts that are really running in the in the practice and we're trying to to get the knowledge of how to you know how to bring all these um, things together um, and, and then you were asking me also in the first question. 
for the students, they're studying now. I mean, you you won your competition at a yeah. very much uh, very early age in your career. How did that happen? Typically, yeah, yeah. I I think like it was just uh, the a passion for architecture. Maybe like the the fact that um, I don't know. It's it's uh, in a way uh, the the way I exist is through architecture in a certain way. Like because it's. Uh, the way I see space, the way we, because architecture is a is a practice uh, for most for a lot of people. When you you decide to become an architect, it's also you're dictating or bringing to yourself a way of living. So it's just like pushing oneself to live it really and to to listen to the environment and uh, and go with it. And it's. And things happened really like uh, finding, I was looking for a competition, I found it, I invited two colleagues of mine at that time, and then we started that and then we won and we continued. We could have stopped there. We could have stopped there because when we won the competition, like I had a meeting with Jean Nouvel at that time and uh, they told me, oh, it's an idea competition, we will never be built and uh, just mm -hmm. drop that and continue. You have at least a career here, you have positions. So I said, Mm, I'm, I'm gonna take the risk. <laughs> so, so just like also taking the risk and say, okay, well let's try, let's let's see where it leads. And 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 it's all about a human venture, like meeting the museum uh, director, who was really a very uh, strong woman who wanted really this building to happen. The uh, government was very young at that time, so, so and also patience because it took 10 years. Like a, lo a lot of my projects are tur turtle projects like uh, that start and then you have to, you know, strive them to, to uh, and keep on and try to help to find the budgets. And so it's, it's really like also how, how to draw the line be between the, our passion as architects and as uh, really we have a very emotional attachment to that practice and the business because you, you grow business as well. You're not only just doing it has to survive. So how do you, how do you grow these two uh, together? So it's always like, um, uh, like a, a really standing on this <laughs> very uh, thin line where you have really big uh, valleys uh, <laughs> on the side. So. Um, okay, so thanks to our sponsors. And thanks to Dean El Huri and our panelists. And thanks to Lina for giving us a chance to inhabit her sensible mind for the last hour. Uh, we hope that we can entice you to come to Miami at one point in the future, perhaps after the pandemic. I mean, you can come here and you will find friends like no, in no, no other part of the world. If you, um, I don't know, Dean, do you have any comments? Last minute comments? Just that I would like to share how satisfying this for me because it was great to see the amazing work, but also to see it in the context of Lebanon and that history and culture that I have obviously an attachment to was really profoundly moving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Lena. Please join us on March 31st for our next lecture with Marina Tabasum from Bangladesh. And we hope to see you there. So thank you and have a good rest of the afternoon. Regards thank you Michael. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Michael. I can see you. Bye-bye. <laughs>